Welcome to the Data Coffee Break Podcast. I'm Mark. And I'm Christian. If you are passionate about data like us, take a seat, relax, and join us to our coffee break where we discuss all things data. And remember, there are no filters, no PR. It's just a real life experience. So let's begin. Welcome and let's get started. So very first episode, Christian, of the Data Coffee Break podcast. How are you doing? Uh, good, Mark. Yeah, I'm on my third cup of coffee today. Really need a break, <laughs> got to be honest with you. And yeah, super excited for being on the, on the first episode with you today with our guests. How are you doing, Mark? I'm good. I'm starting my first coffee of the day, so I should be all right in my case. <laughs> um, so yeah, for today's guest, we invited a person with more than 20 years of experience in the software and data industry. He has worked as pre-sales solution architect in many companies such as IBM, Avectas, MicroStrategy, Tableau. He holds a business a Bachelor of Business Administration degree from Wichita University. Maybe you will correct me if I'm wrong on the pronunciation, as well as a degree of statistics from University of Stockholm. As a pre-sales professional, he has presented at multiple conferences such as a well-renowned Data Innovation Summit in 2018 and 2022. And we know you personally as ex-colleague or colleague. Um, you are a data visualization enthusiast, an amazing leader, and a proud father of two kids. So Peter Johnson, welcome to the Data Coffee Break podcast. How are you doing first? Thank you so much for those wonderful words, Mark and, and, and Christian. That, that I, I sound almost a little bit older than I may sh- should be, but no, I'm I'm doing fine. Thank you, very very good. I know also that I'm one hour ahead of you guys, so I think I'm on my fifth cup. <laughs> I think I should be okay anyway. Okay. Completely connect, caffeinated on that. Absolutely. Uh, I, and very first question, actually, do you think this title is a provocation? Can data really be democratized? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little bit provoking. Yes, yes, yes. But the the the, the truth of it, and I think we're, we're going towards that, right? Since you shared the the title with me before, is what is democratization? What what is the definition of that? And if we knew that, then it might not be that provoking after all. Who knows? But but a little bit provoking, and I think that's the okay. that's the reason why. Yeah. In, in your simple words, what is democratization of data in this case? If we start by there. In your perspective, like everyone is having a different point of view, maybe on that. <laughs> I mean, first of all, for for three uh, non-native English speakers on on the on the microphone here today, mm-hmm. that that is probably one of the hardest words yes. we're going to have to to pronounce here today. The uh, the democratization of data and so forth. But but what is it? I mean, yeah, it depends, right? I mean, I think it depends. It's probably a different thing to different <laughs> yeah. organizations. To some, it's probably daunting and pretty difficult, and and. Uh, and big and to some it may not but i mean it is sharing information and data across the organization so that people that have questions will have data to answer their questions that's that's what it means to me at least right to make sure that it's available through different processes and means and technologies not sure that's the wikipedia or the correct definition though, but that's <laughs> yeah that's a really good point i mean the, the one that you raised i mean it's all about how you share, right? And the whole point of uh, of today's conversation is to have it, as you just said, like this is your view of of democratization. And either, even if Wikipedia may have something more, mm. let's say something different, but it's a it's a good a good element to start there, right? Because when we meet with lots of customers or people that work every day with data and they are sharing data, they sometimes they think that that's just enough mm. right and and so then rather sooner rather than later they realize that actually yes we're sharing all this data but what is the value that people are getting out of it right so that's mm. that's something that perhaps i guess in your views peter what else apart from sharing goes hand in hand with democratization yeah and, and like you said sharing data i think we all also worked in organizations and with organizations that feel that they're sharing reports and yeah. thinking that they're actually sharing data. They're sharing somebody else's view of what should or, or maybe shouldn't be important, right? Mm-hmm. And we all know that when you do it that way, when you predefine content and you package it to, organiz- to, to people in an organization, you know you're going to have loads of people that are going to look at that and say, 
how about this, this, and that that I can't mm-hmm. see? So you will always have people who find what's missing. What are they hiding from me? Or maybe not hiding by default, but they know at least that there are some things here that I cannot answer by just looking at this predefined or pre-packaged uh, content. So I think, to be quite honest, in, in, in all honesty, most organizations are not even yet even sharing data. They're sharing pre-packaged content of some of the data. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's probably even yeah. worse that uh, the, uh, most of them haven't even got further than that. So that's, that's what I think goes hand in hand with, with this democratization process of thinking. What steps can you take? How fast? And, and what leaps and what, what technologies and what processes need to be in place to, to make this happen? And I usually see this as, I, I, I see a trend or I see a, a pattern in that that I've seen for a number of years that um, it's a bit of a... Um, uh, uh, generation process. Yeah, I used to say that if you're looking at the, the organizations born in the cloud, uh, that, that's nowadays a pretty old definition of something. But uh, organizations like we have the the Uber, the Spotify, Airbnb, Tesla, the thing, the organizations that haven't existed that long actually, they can do more in this space because they have no legacy. Mm-hmm. They don't have a whole lot of data to bring with them that actually exists for regulatory purposes or, or legal or, or whatever. And they can do much, they can do a lot of things much faster than a lot of organi- yeah. organizations that they're actually competing with. And uh, if you look at it that way, and these organizations also seem to attract a younger and more, more versatile crowd of, of resources and employees, again, they can move quicker in many uh, aspects when it comes to sharing information, sharing data, work with data, handle or understanding data even. And uh, then we look at some of the traditional, uh, nothing wrong with the banks and the insurance and, and, and the traditional retail organizations who have so much legacy. They are many people. Mm. They have big organizations. Some of them are, are, are bigger than many countries, actually. That's how, how large some of these organizations actually are. Yeah. So they, they're democratization process are going to be completely different and i think we need to be very uh, aware of that that uh, do, you, do you think it requires like something restarting from the ground up because so you started to speak about like company who have a legacy and more startup like companies starting in the cloud and when you start hmm. to think to speak about that i was thinking about <laughs> what i went through two weeks ago registering for for a bank here in the uk what we will call a legacy bank um, and it's been just a pain. <laughs> it took me three weeks <laughs> to get access to mm. to the account and the app. And at the opposite, so if you know me, I'm I'm very talkative about one of the one of the fintech startup here in the UK, uh, who, who has been been built like the past five seven years, something like that. And the process is so easy, and they've been successful because, as you described, mm. the Uber, the Netflix, mm. etc. They yeah. just started. Um, with a different mindset, with a different concept. So do you think for those massive company where we ask them like to democratize data, they need to maybe create a spin-up of their organization to be able to do that? Or is it still yeah. possible within the, their own organization, actually? Very good question. That's a I tricky think, one. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're going to need to do some of that for sure. But I think also if you're looking at those organizations and I have some experience also with public sector actually mm. here here in, in Sweden where, where I'm located who have done fantastic things uh, in, in, in real short time actually taking their old, old legacy environments and, and, and processes and actually turning something into very modern and very uh, uh, cloud and... Uh, and web-based environments that, that actually works pretty well. And I think that's personally driven. They, they actually got access to good people who, mm. who had ideas mm. and maybe got a bit of funding to, to realize some of those ideas. And, uh, and uh, I think they're very also then dependent on those uh, individuals to make these uh, <laughs> successful ideas happen. happen. Uh, but but I think to, to a larger extent, they're going to be very dependent on having access to some really, really good, uh, smart people who come in and, and do uh, and, and get the benefit of a doubt to do something uh, different. That, that's yeah. what I think. Talking about legacy and people, right? I think there is a concept there that is all about culture 
as well, right? Mm. So there is, a, as you mentioned, there's some, some of these uh, sectors that there is even a, a culture element there. I've always heard this concept of, um, called data culture. Do you, what, what's your mm. view on that, what data culture and, and how it actually overlaps with democratization? Again, good question, because when, when, when I was asked to participate in this podcast, I, uh, I, the, the first thing that came to my mind is a presentation that I did in May mm. this year uh, at a big uh, conference, and it, had around, it was around the concept of data literacy. Mm. And we actually had to make the definitions yeah. of what is data culture, what data skills, what is data literacy. And then now we're talking data democracy and, and how do they actually uh, combine what is what and what is thing. I think data culture is extremely important and I think it's going to play a huge role in that and the culture that it brings and what people are trying to do with it. Mm. For that presentation we based it on two big, big surveys big studies done by a very known uh, uh, global uh, consulting company who who surveyed about 2,000 people 2,000 decision makers and some some workers around the world and came up with some very interesting numbers that we actually based the entire presentation some 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 workshops on it the inter- interesting there was that looking at the numbers of looking uh, finding out what is the what how do these organizations see themselves in data culture and data literacy comparing, for example, European-based with uh, the rest of the world, since we're all here uh, uh, in, in Europe right now and stemming, as I said, nearly 80% of those EMEA-based decision makers, the, the European uh, people who actually were decision makers, CSC, CXOs and so forth, uh, 80% of them actually think that they're successfully equipping their workers with some really good and necessary data skills and, and so forth, actually producing a data culture. Mm. But when interviewing the workers of the same organizations, only half of them agreed. Oh, well. so, so looking at that, what is the discrepancy of how an organization actually see themselves? And then when you talk to the people, it may or may not actually uh, correlate at all. That is a very interesting part when we're mentioning the word uh, the word culture in in the same sentence as well. Yeah, and a part is obviously so we start to have more like if we think about people being recruited out of uni or being trained uh, the last five years, where data start to be more preeminent. I see a lot of programs where data literacy, Mm -hmm. what we can call data literacy, but in in those programs, let's say at uni or in those kind of uh, starters, uh, young starters uh, programs uh, from some companies, like this is embedded in the culture, but it's for other other individuals, Mm -hmm. it's more complicated in in this case, who they potentially, as you said, leaders think they are ready for that, but internally they don't have specific training or something like that. Maybe the main mm. uh, one of the reason, and also, wh- what training do they need if they were if they're mm. not coming with this from universities or even high school and, and so forth and coming out in the in the business world? And we know what organizations these young individuals return to is going to be the Netflix and the the, <laughs> the mm. uh, Airbnbs and, and Teslas and so forth. But what 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 training are they supposed to to go for? Yeah. Another. Interesting factor that we found out in that study that we actually spend a lot of time on also when we had such a big uh, audience in that room was also like, if we're talking to some of those decision makers who know they're struggling with this, who know actually they are on the other side of the spectrum and, and not really go, uh, reaching through uh, and, and, and can call themselves uh, uh, a data democratization uh, part of um, the, their business, is that what, what are the biggest barriers what are the biggest barriers from actually doing, what, uh, getting better at this? And, and, and we had a number, I think a list of five or six uh, of those mm. uh, barriers. And the top three, I remember, the, the third one from the top was that they're missing the knowledge on how to improve data skills. Mm. They don't even know how to do yeah. it. If they say, okay, data is important, which we have data, we have databases, data warehouses and things, and we should share, share that. But what do we do then? Mm. Do we need better tools? Do we need better technologies? So do we need better uh, soft skills and things? They, they don't even know what, what the skills they're, they're lacking. The second one, of course, is a more obvious one, and that's budget considerations. Mm. This costs money. It's going gonna, it's gonna to need to be an investment for some of these uh, big organizations to, yeah. to, to get the technology and the processes in place to share this. And the top one, I think, was the, uh, the most mind-baffling of them all, was like, 
we don't even even have enough skilled staff mm. for training of doing this. They're thinking that they need to do it all themselves. That in itself becomes overwhelming when we're looking at what the world looks like today. There, there are going to be cost reductions. There are going to be reductions in, in all kinds of areas. And, of course, these improvement areas are going to be uh, suffering in that uh, aspect, I think, for, for a long, long time going forward. But I think it's just going to be more important to have. Yeah, it should be uh, a priority for them. It should be a priority, if, yeah. If they, don't, if they don't think about that, they will be all outpaced yeah. by all the companies yes. who will take the train, basically, yeah. And these are just the responses of the organizations who know they're strugg struggling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what I usually see, you know, and, and I think you tap into really something really important. I find your uh, investigation fascinating, by the way. And what, one of the things that we see is like, okay, so we have all these people that are willing to know or willing to get trained. Mm. And in your experience, do you see this coming from leadership? In, the, in an organization? I mean, leadership, of course, you always need to, to have a buy-in. But your experience, do you see this more like um, this is driven by the bottom of the organization? I'm talking about bottom, mm -hmm. talking about people in the field, people that, that are um, working with data every day and say, look, we need to find a solution to work with data. Or do you see more mm -hmm. that success rate or better success rate when it comes from the top? I think when it works, it comes from the top. Okay. When it works, you have leadership buy-in and leadership getting, making this a priority. Without leadership, a priority and buy-in, I think it's, it's, it's going to be very, very mm. difficult. And that's what I see as well uh, in, in the experiences that I have, uh, the, the organizations that they, they have gotten the budgets, they have gotten some, some, some funding for this, and, and leaders think this is really, really important. We, we actually have a, had a section in that presentation as well that we, uh, I forgot what it, what it was called, but it was actually around <clears throat> what do you do if your managers are not doing this, if they're not leading by example? In, in, in poor English, it was called the bullshit factor. I mean, people, or, or employees will see through mm -hmm. if, if, if leaders yeah. are pretending that we should do this, this, and that, we should uh, have, make data-driven uh, uh, decisions and blah, blah, blah. But if they're not doing it themselves, if they're not backing up their decisions by real facts and numbers and actually using the same mm. uh, information uh, providing that like, like everybody else, people will see through it and they won't take it as uh, seriously. Yep. Uh, another really uh, interesting part of that. But, but I, for sure, leadership buying and, and, and top down is going to be very, very important. So we need to have whole leadership going through like, um, data literacy and data culture trainings and get them like to get uh, the hand dirty with data basically as a start i absolutely absolutely try to be a bit fair here you know not not devil's advocate but perhaps a bit do you really think that you should democratize all of your data like being pragmatic right so we work with organizations so of all types i haven't been on a meeting where the cdo or the person that's in charge of of data say like yeah let's actually open open this with to, to the organization there's always um and i'm talking mm. about the basics here right oh you should not see this data you should not see this this sort of information but really like mm. be open to share everything do you, do you have a view there on on Yes, I do. And uh, no, not all data can and should not probably be, be uh, available to everyone when we're thinking mm -hmm. like data privacy exactly, and, yeah. and yeah. regulations and, uh, and, and GDPR and all these kind of things, specifically in public sector hospitals and things like that. So I, I think it's, 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 uh, it's granted. But I think what you're, what you're reaching for is like, what about everything else that is actually yeah. <laughs> normal data, right? Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I say, <laughs> why not? What would be the worst thing that could happen if we make too much data available to an organization? I mean, granted, they, they will be drowning in it. We're drowning in it today anyway, right? I mean, we can't even get through a Google search without uh, being very drowned in, in, in yeah. suggestions and, and stuff, right? Uh, but what would be the worst thing that could happen? Good example is I was working with a customer here in, in Sweden not too long ago who were deploying a big uh, uh, data and analytics uh, solution. And their data leader, he was from IT, but he had a very pragmatic view on this around permissions and authentication mm. through the technology. Mm. And we, we all come from this 
an environment where we should protect things and we should lock down things and maybe we should allow it to trickle down and make sure that people inherit certain permissions and, and access rights and so forth. That's that's how we've been trained traditionally, right, to, to deploy these kind of solutions. Yeah. He thought that was quite complex. So he said, why don't we turn it upside down? This was actually an insurance company, pretty <laughs> leading insurance organization in the, in the Nordics, actually. They turned it upside down and said, Let's forget about what would be the worst thing that could happen if we make everything available internally. Then people started yelling, of course, hey, come on, we're an insurance company and we can't make this. this some, some information here is pretty important. Sure, but let's start locking that down first and see what we can leave open. And they did their permission model that way instead. Surely they locked down a lot of data sources and, and any information that, that can't be uh, available. But the rest they left completely open. Amazing, and he said my permission uh, model of my uh, uh, BI and analytics solution is extremely simple. Mm-hmm. I have not complicated anything yes. at all. There, there are a few tables and there are, there are a few folders and so forth that are locked down, and I, I can handle that quite easily. Uh, so I think, answering your question, before I would be more hesitant. I think I'm more yeah. open today. There are things, of course, we need to lock mm-hmm. down for for of course. obvious reasons. But apart from that, why should we? And at which, at which level, like this, uh, this person said, like, okay, let's give it a try um, to open. Was it posi- was he positioned as like a, da- a chief data officer, or does it not no, no, no? He was mid level, okay. mid level IT. He was um, he was set to manage the 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 BI the data analytic, analytics mm. platform, uh, technology wise. So no, he was mid level. He might be listening to this. Day. So um, even at, at at this level, he was able to to make the decision and get the trust from from his leadership yes. to to do that. Yes, at least to give it a try, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that can be sp- super scary for a lot of organizations. It's <laughs> it's a massive shift. Yes, he. I remember when he shared this information in in a, in a, in an open auditorium in a, yeah. in, a, in at a conference where. Peers, yeah. other people in the insurance organization world raised their hand and said, what you're saying, I, I find extremely provo- provo- provocative, <laughs> provocative right now. <laughs> okay. So that, that led to very uh, interesting um, coffee break discussions afterwards. Quick one. If you're enjoying this episode and our show, please make sure that you follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram at the Data Coffee Break Podcast. Links in the description. Also, if you'd like to grow this community with us, Think about sharing this episode with a friend or a colleague interested about all things data. Now back to the episode. So if we think about our audience, like some of them are consultants, pre-sales, etc. How would you advise them like to approach those kind of discussions hmm. um, with mid-level managers or um, kind of even business users when it comes to this aspect of unlocking more data, uh, approaching data culture or literacy for them don't overcomplicate things yeah. try to keep it simple simplify as much as you can to begin with what we're doing what we're, we're, we're professionals in, in in doing on our j jobs is complicated enough anyway it's going to get complicated sooner or later when we get down to but don't start with that if we can simplify things to in the beginning let's do that Keep keep it keep it clear. Keep it simple. Somebody said many many years ago when I started, think mm. big and start small. I think that's so smart. That's great. Of course, we want to we want to produce a very very big solution that will help uh, a lot of people uh, uh, reach good data insights and so forth. But at the beginning, keep it quite small and see how far mm. we get with that approach, and then add layers of complexity. And, and and we all know that uh, the complexities around permission models yeah. and so forth can be extremely detailed, right? And I said, don't do that from the beginning. Start with keeping it as, as open as you can and see where you need to add uh, locks and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's a great advice to give. I mean, even if um, our, our industry is quite suscepti- susceptible for get a lot of buzzwords, Right, and you have a lot of people that now, now even with data mesh, yeah. right, or data fabric, and you know, and they start from from or people tend to start from there because it's a trend, which is super complex to get there, and in the end things become yes. a unicorn, yeah. 
right? So I think mm. your your advice is is really valuable. Yes. Coming back in, I'm I'm trying to get my head around like uh, obviously some. You were speaking about the case where this client was presenting that in the auditorium and people say like, you are very provocative. <laughs> um, do you see, I mean, there is more and more needs in this case or do you see as a good way to protect some level of data still yeah. giving yeah. access, sufficient level of access, like more data ob obfuscation tool. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing the right way, but means to obfuscate the, the data to the right individuals. Is this something rising in this case uh, for, for the wider industry? Help me, help me understand that more. <laughs> <laughs> um, data obfuscation tools such as like a classic use example is um, you... In a data set, um, mm. this tool is going to yeah. hide the credit card number for most of the oh, business okay, users. Okay. And only for a very specific set of users, they have the right to see credit card number. Obviously, it's all linked, linked to basically PEII uh, type of information, mm. personal identifiable information. Yes, yeah. yes. To be quite honest, no, there, there are only actually a few cases that I can remember that are actually being uh, required to handle that kind of uh, uh, okay. masking of data yeah. or, or, or so forth, uh, hiding. Uh, I mean, we, we have other technology. We can work with role-level security. We, we can protect certain uh, aspects of information with other ways. But when you really need to mm -hmm. mask certain sets like uh, yeah. personal identification and so forth, that's probably where I have uh, experienced it. May, maybe it's more with like banks and so forth that I don't have that much true experience with but um, in public sector yes for sure it has been a few cases that's really good Peter I mean everything that we have discussed is really important but more importantly is what is the end result right what are the benefits of adopting this I mean coming back even to Mark's question around like you've been provocative <laughs> to, to that part I mean like I guess <laughs> it's all about what you can get out of it is that correct what, what's your experience on that I have more um, theoretical answer to, <laughs> theoretical answers to that than I have hard hard uh, 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 facts yeah. and numbers. But I mean, what we see, what we seen, and, and specifically when we did this presentation in uh, early this summer, and we based it on that, that uh, pretty good uh, survey that we found, when organizations succeed with democratizing data, getting. Uh, uh, decent amount of, of data skills and, and data literacy spread throughout an organization. And this is like not necessarily big organizations or small, I mean, or anything. I, I think it, it, it goes for all. We see that increased innovation almost doubles. The innovation pace at an organization almost wow. doubled in the, in the places where they, uh, where they uh, got, got the data maturity uh, levels up. We see uh, uh, that the cost reduction went from... Uh, uh, from 52 to 76 percent. That's, that's mm. over 25 percent in cost reduction just by doing things smart and working with data. The retention, and I think that's something that I think uh, we, we got a lot of attention to when we talked about it. The retention numbers are almost uh, 15 percent that organizations mm. tend to retain their employees much, at a much higher scale if we uh, if we use data, uh, democratizing data, and having data skills available, and uh, revenue uh, increase somewhere around uh, 30 35 percent uh, as well there there are, there are huge wow. factors huge benefits that we would see in these uh, in these areas and uh, and then again I also think that also why like mark said there why some of those organizations can outperform and outpace their competitors mm. basically they don't have too much legacy to handle and they can do some of these things quicker I mean come on the the benefits are quite obvious and yeah. uh, it's uh, that's for them to stay in the game, basically. So yes, for some yes. of them, yeah. Great. No, truly insightful, Peter. Thanks a lot for for all of that. So we're getting at, at the end of this episode. So I have uh, one or two questions for you. Um, Here comes the tricky <laughs> questions. Now, <I> <laughs> what is the single most important um, professional piece of advice you ever received in your career? Wow, professional advice. Um, I uh, I had a manager a number of years ago who uh, 
I don't, I don't know if it was so much an advice as as a, as a recommendation or something, but we we work with technology, right? And and many times we are expected to explain it to technical audience, but also non technical audiences. And and this guy was like, Peter, whatever you're doing, when you know so when you know something well enough, simplify it. If you can simplify it so that the bigger audience understand it, you're going to get so much more out of what you're trying to say than trying, uh, maybe I was or wasn't, but trying to impress on the people that are, are, are technical, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, simplifying yeah. what we do will take us much further than, uh, than we think, I think. That, uh, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good advice, I think. And, um, but I think it was also maybe a bit, bit of a feedback from him to me on, <laughs> on the previous. <laughs> from an from experience. An experience <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I, I remember that, and I, I think that's pretty good, yeah. I like this one. Yes, what we're trying to do for the audience is that during all these episodes, we want to, you know, collect a bunch sure. of advices. Yeah. You know, so you just started with the first one; it's going to be at the top. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you as a guinea pig. Yeah, <laughs> <I'm nuts. laughs> but yes. Was it a good one, or should fantastic. I change? <laughs> I, I love it. Okay. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time. Uh, where can people follow you or find you? Where are you most most of the time in social media? Good question. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I love talking about these things. As you as you heard, as you understand, very passionate. I uh, I have a, I, I tweet and I post on LinkedIn. Uh, my LinkedIn posts are almost only <laughs> professional, or, or most of the times related to my employee. Yeah. Not always, but most of the time, my tweets are a little bit more uh, personal and uh, could right. be about. Basically. Okay, we will put your Twitter hand or, uh, on the yeah. description then. You can put <laughs> yeah, any, okay. any of them, that's fine. No, great, fantastic. Thanks a lot, Peter. Thanks so much. See you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode. This podcast represents our views and not the ones of our employers. Our mission at the Data Coffee Break podcast is to inform you and help you grow in this always changing data field. Follow us and get into the conversation with the community on our LinkedIn page and Instagram. See you next Tuesday, and until then, keep your data caffeinated. <laughs>